In this series of Healthy Ireland at Your Library videos, viewers are encouraged to develop a positive approach to caring for your mental health. Created by and courtesy of the HSE, all content is based on evidence and research around the areas of well-being and positive psychology. Over eight episodes, we'll provide hints, tips and guidance on how to care for your mental health every day. We're all aware of increasing levels of anxiety and depression. This series gives us the tips to flourish and thrive. It encourages us to discover and appreciate our strengths so we can use them to enjoy life and to look forward to the future. Today, we are looking to reframe the conversation around men's mental health, not only on a personal level, but from a systemic point of view. Looking beyond individual behaviour towards cultural change within the environments in which men live, work and play, so as to bring about sustained change. I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker who's going to contextualise this webinar for us. And that's Dr. Noel Richardson. He's up there in the screen already with me. Um, and Noel has been so much part of men's health on the island of Ireland. Noel, I could go on forever talking about the background to your work, but I suppose just to say that you are the director of the Centre for Men's Health in the Southeast Technological University. You're seconded half time to the HSE with responsibility for men's health policy and implementation. You've been involved in policy research resource development, capacity building, you name it, and all you've been very much involved in it. So it's lovely that you're here to start us off and contextualise what real change looks like in the context of masculinities and men's health. So I leave it to you, Noel. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome. Um, it's a fine day here in Kilkenny as well, Larkin, so it's great to be here. Um, I think an important starting point for today's webinar is the question in the title, actually, what does real change look like. And I'm sure most of us would agree how important it is to periodically take a step back and to ask questions of our work. And I think men's health is no different, really. Um, and I think it's, it's really important in terms of how we might engage men in health programs and sustain their engagement over time by you know, asking fundamental questions. Um, and I remember when I started in men's health, probably about 20 years ago now, um, I was interested to note that some of my colleagues were, were asking questions like, you know, where are the men and why are men not here? Sometimes in, in language a bit more colourful than I, than I would use in a webinar. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, over time, I suppose those questions became a bit more sophisticated. And they asked questions like, well, what do men want? Or how can we make our service or programme more appealing to men? So in terms of setting a context for today's webinar, I think one of my most important tasks is to emphasise how important it is to ask questions of our work even if we start with a very basic question, where are the men? I think this over time um, can, can bring us to, to, to looking at kind of what real change would look like. So in terms of masculinities and men's health, what does real change look like? I think the focus of today's webinar is on a few key things. It's looking beyond individual behavior to focus on systemic or cultural change within the environments in which men live, work and play. So the presentations we'll see later from Ashling, Shane and Diana aren't just focused about health behaviours or changing lifestyle behaviours, for example, or mental health. They are much more about bringing about sustained systemic cultural change within the organisations that are being targeted. So that's a really important starting point. And I like to that, we're looking at trying to reframe men's health men's attitudes and approach to their health. So, and again, this is crucially important in bringing about more sustained change over time. Um, so that, that, that's really important to emphasize. I would like to just to, to, to highlight at the start, you know, how important it is that we, that, you know, the conversations of masculinity sometimes gravitate towards this more kind of stereotypical portrayals, the kind of alpha male type characteristics that typically focus on a fixed or narrow set of behaviours, with little account being given to the context of these behaviours. And thankfully, we, we have a national men's health policy that sets out a much more kind of nuanced uh, framework to understand how masculinities are shaped by the environments in which men live, work and play, and also how gender intersects with other aspects of identity 
to produce multiple masculinities that you know that, that intersect with things like social class, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and so on. So it's it's really important that we look beyond this kind of narrow construction of masculinity as as a, a, a fixed set of behaviors that are endemic or entrenched in men to understand how, how masculinity is as a much more fluid concept um, that that gender intersects with other aspects of identity, as, I, as I've mentioned. And that, that gives us a much more holistic and total view of, of how masculinities operate. Um, what's also important is that our national men's health policy and the research which underpinned it set out a broad set of principles that help us to understand gender a bit better. So in our national men's health policy, we talk about a key set of principles like a social determinants approach, a community development approach, uh, engaging with other government departments, so not looking beyond health, for example, adopting a strengths-based approach. And all of, it's all focused on men taking ownership of their own health. So it's really important, again, to understand the kind of the, the key principles that are allied to gender, that we don't look at gender in isolation, but rather as in context of other sets of key strategies to engage men. The WHO sets out a really nice kind of um, continuum, if you like, of, of what gendered approaches to engaging men or women look like. And they start from gender unequal or gender blind perspectives. And it's, it's, it's interesting, even at this stage, in a lot of health policy documents do adopt a gender blind approach. They don't really consider gender at all. So as we move down to this continuum, we're, we move towards what, what we call, what call gender transformative approaches to engaging men. And this is really where it's at. And, and this is where I think the programs that we'll hear about later in the webinar offer us really insightful examples of, of what gender transformative approaches to men's health looks like. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's looking beyond the, the, that kind of set of individual behaviors to understand in the context and the environments in which these programs are delivered. I would just look at the, the language that's used and, and maybe wonder about that in good ways to transform harmful gender norms, role and relations. Um, I think the, the word harmful is a bit judgmental. And we need, we need to consider um, gender patterns of behavior in the context of wider issues that I mentioned earlier. And it mightn't be a great approach to, you know, portion of blame to men at an individual level, but rather to understand the context more broadly. So this kind of gender transformative approach to men's health is, is, is really important. Um, this, this slide also sets out um, how we might go about developing or applying gender transformative approaches to men's health. And a key point here is that it's, it's got to do with program design, program implementation and program evaluation. So there's kind of different layers to what gender transformative looks like. And in program design, we need to engage men from the outset. Um, we need to have gendered approaches to the implementation of programs. And crucially, we need to apply a gender lens to the evaluation of programs also. also. And these are some of the engagement strategies that we might find resonate with some of the presentations we'll, we'll hear later. We've spoken about these before, but just to summarize, they, they adopt a very, very much a kind of strengths-based approach, engaging men from the outset, you know, listening, listening to men, what, what they would like, uh, engaging men as partners in, 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 the, in the development and implementation of programs. Um, and these are context specific. You know, it's not, it's not the same set of rules that work for every, every situation or every context. So we need to adapt and modify these as we go. A key part of this, so it's really important that we look at engaging men, but we also need to think about how we can build capacity within service providers to um, bring about sustainable and real change. And our engaged National Men's Health Programme is really important in that regard. And again, it, it looks at not just equipping service providers with the skills to effectively more engage men, but it also looks at 
trying to transform culture within the organizations that these service providers work in. So that's a crucial point as well. And also, it's not just looking at health services and the most recent addition to engage on firm ground where we're working with ag advisors to engage farmers is a really good example of trying to broaden the net in terms of you know, who can engage men effectively and, and, and brings about a kind of blurring of the lines between health and non-health sectors in a, in a positive way. One of the first programs that I was ever associated with was the Men's Health and Wellbeing Program in the Larkin Centre in Dublin. I, think I just come back to this this morning before I hand over to the others. Um, I, I think it emphasises a key point, which is about valuing the men who engage in programmes. There's nothing here about smoking reductions or change in alcohol or increased physical activity, even though they, they were objectives of the programme. The key point here is that the men were engaged as partners and in a very respectful way. So this, this, this is the language that came through in the evaluation, you know, accepting, nurturing, supporting, listening, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this, this really set the tone, I think, for a lot of the work that followed. Um, and it's instrumental to bring about real change um, and sustainable change. And I would like to mention another program which we're not going to deal with today, but again, just to emphasize a couple of things about this um, in terms of the, the program engaged with the, code, the target group from the outset, they gave careful consideration to what, what the, the, the men wanted. It was a partnership approach, which is really important, and we'll hear more about that later as well. Um, and it, it, it used some of the kind of generic principles that I spoke about earlier, the gender-specific strategies engaging men, which, which are really important. And finally, um, we'll hear from Ashley later about a men's sheds program. But again, this is an earlier study that informed the Sheds for Life program. And the, no more than the Larkin Centre, it, it, it talks about you know, valuing the men and respecting the men has been crucially important. So the, the, the findings talked about using and developing new skills, feeling a sense of belonging, supporting and being supported by peers, and contributing to community. These were the things that contributed to men's overall well-being. So in summary then, before I hand over, um, or we look at a video on, on the men's shed just to, 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 to build on this. The, the key points I think we need to make this morning is it is important to ask questions. Even if we start by asking where are the men and build from there, that's moving beyond the gender blind approach, which is really important. It's also important to look at gender beyond the scope of individual behaviors and to seek to understand how gender operates in complex ways and, and intersects with other things like social class, ethnicity, race, etc. Um, and gender isn't fixed, it, it, it constantly shifts and changes over time. And if we were to bring about real change, sustainable change, we need to engage men as partners from the outset in our work. So I'm going to transition to, before we get to Ashling's first presentation, I'm going to, we're going to show a short video on men's sheds, which kind of exemplifies some of the points I've been trying to make here. Thank you very much. The shed started here uh, about two years ago, just over two years ago, and uh, it started, there was just seven or eight of us involved. We used to meet once a week in the local soccer club. I retired two years ago and I wanted something, I knew I wasn't going to sit at home. So I came in here to join the men's shed and I have the, one of the best things I ever done in my life was to join the men's shed. I was retired three years before I joined the shed and I was in dire need of finding something because I live in the countryside and talking to the dog all day is not it's okay, but it's not these needs of things. You come in here and you have real human contact and I think that's the lovely part about it. And there's a sort of a unity in the group and every new person comes in here, he's made to feel just welcome. John Evoy originally started up the sheds around the 2009 uh, Mark, in 1998 they would have started in Australia and John see, had the foresight to see that this could really kind of foster and grow in Ireland. So 
So I first encountered the Men's Shed through my father becoming one of the founding members and he worked here for a few months with all the rest of the men and one morning he, he passed away here suddenly one morning in the shed itself. Um, a few months later myself and my sister were doing a big fundraiser concert so as part of that we had an idea to ask the men to sing a song. At first the lad said absolutely not but she convinced us and brought us round. You're never too old to start something. You're never, one of the men here is 73 and he never heard his voice until last year. He never heard that he had a singing voice, which I find amazing. And all of the men here and their interaction in the shed, they're finding out new things about themselves all the time. It's the fact that there are things out there and being in an organised organize group, you look for it and you'll find it. Whereas on your own, you might not. When you join a shed, you walk through that door, everyone's equal. And that's very, very important for people. There's no hierarchy, there's no one telling you what to do. You set your own agenda, you go in there and you meet people and you meet other men from similar backgrounds or quite diverse backgrounds, who all of a sudden when they come through the door, it, you leave everything at the door. It's not like a committee dictating to the members, this is what we're going to do next. It's more a question of what would you like to do next? We come to the men's shed, well I certainly do, because it's something to look forward to. And it's a break in the day and I'm still working at various bits and bobs, but I just will not miss my time coming in here. Well, I think what keeps people coming here is the camaraderie. Oh, we love the camaraderie. And we say we get a com companionship and we get a bit of crack. We have a good time here and we do a bit of work as well. Go down, have a look, talk to people. It's for everyone. It's for every man. I recommend it to every man in Ireland. There's an Ashling McGrath is going to join us now. And Ashing is a researcher and lecturer in the School of Health and Science in the Southeast Technological University. She's been very, very much involved in relation to the Sheds for Life programme. And her work has involved co-designing men's health promotion and the men's sheds with a focus specifically, I suppose, on what Noel was talking about, encouraging men to engage with health and well-being more meaningfully uh, through gendered approaches. So, Ashling, I'll leave it to you. And I know it's going to be really, really insightful as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Lorcan for that lovely introduction. It was lovely to see some of the familiar faces in the Kilcockman shed as well. Um, so I am just going to spend a few minutes, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today, but I just want to introduce uh, Sheds for Life. So um, Sheds for Life is a community-based men's health programme that we delivered with men in the men's sheds. So we brought the health promotion to the men in that setting where, you know, it was safe and it was familiar. And I just want to talk a little bit about, I suppose, why that worked today. Um, so just to set some context and, and I guess to reiterate a lot of what, what Noel had said and, and along the, the vein of this, I suppose, conversation is for real change to happen. I, the question is, I suppose, we really need to know how to talk about masculinities and, and are we doing that right? So we can say men have so worse outcome, health outcomes compared to females globally. Um, and we know it's due to a host of complex reasons. And also, yes, aligning to dominant uh, masculine traits can conflict with reasons to seek help and conflict with health promoting behaviours. But as Noel said, we know it's a little bit more nuanced than that now, that there's a diversity of masculinities and there's so much evidence to show that men do want to seek help and that they are trying to do that and that they want to engage in health promoting behaviours. Um, um, but we often refer to men as being hard to reach in health promotion. And the question really is, um, you know, are they hard to reach or are we failing to reach them in terms of are we adequately versed in good gendered health services? Do we know how to talk about it? Are we addressing the structural barriers that men face when they do come to seek help? Um, so that's really important. And we can look at, you know, yeah, changing the men in terms of them. Um, you know, trying to increase their engagement with health and well-being, but also we need to change the system. And that was kind of the underlying premise, I suppose, of Sheds for Life. And um, so why did we deliver, I suppose, health promotion in the men's shed setting, firstly? So the men's sheds are community-based grassroots organisations, and that video summed it up really well for you all there. And there's so much global research out there now to show that they're really health-enhancing before you bring any type of health promotion to them for all of the reasons that you see here and that there's social support, they're inclusive, there's shared learning, there's skills, particularly for maybe older men, men going through major life transitions like retirement or bereavement. And um, because of their non-clinical and familiar environment and the social support they offer, they do appeal to a diverse group of men and men that we would consider maybe hard to reach in terms of maybe being socially disadvantaged or marginalized, or maybe there's some mental health issues there. So, 
they present a really important opportunity for us to to engage men but it's how we do that that's so important so Noel would have spoke a little bit about that as well in terms of maintaining this really important environment and this sense of community so we never want to undermine that um, so through an invested process, I suppose, of engagement with the men in the sheds and um, relationship building and trust building, we co-designed Sheds for Life um, along with the men, the Men's Sheds Association, and also all of the partner organisations in the community that you see here. So we came up with this 10-week initiative, we began with the health check, there was weekly physical activity, healthy eating, mental health, as well as optional components that you can see above. So this gave men a sense of autonomy and control over Sheds for Life and also allowed Sheds to tailor Sheds for Life to suit the individual needs of their shed. But what was really important about it, it wasn't the content, yes, was really, really important, but just want to stress that it was the gendered approaches, so understanding masculinity, how important that was, you know, in terms of the co-designed approach, the hooks that we used, that it was strength-based. We were tapping into the expertise in the room, uh, you know, from the men themselves and giving them that sense of autonomy. So that was really important. Um, and there is an outcomes paper that I uh, sent a link there. I think Colleen is going to kindly share that with all of you. Um, but I suppose what I want to kind of stress, yes, there was um, sustained and important changes in things like physical activity and mental health. And we were able to demonstrate that it was cost effective. But really the legacy of Sheds for Life was that it began to, I suppose, reframe uh, Shedder's perceptions of what it meant to talk about mental health, what it meant to talk meaningfully about health conversations. So Sheds for Life facilitated that and left that legacy there. So the conversations about health and wellbeing became um, reframed as, I suppose, not weak, but a masculine, manly thing to do, to be able to talk to one another about that. And I, one of the shadows really summed that up quite well in one of the quotes that you can see here, that actually the perception out there is that men don't talk, but they do. It's They will talk, but it's the environment and the approach that we take is so important. So I just want to leave you with that message that men will engage, but our focus should be on limiting the barriers that prevent them from doing that. Um, and so that's really the message I'd like you to take away. Um, and if you want to find out more information about the research, we do have a paper that captures the experiences of the men in the sheds and their experience of Sheds for Life uh, coming out soon as well. So if you want to keep an eye on that, you can feel free to contact me or to, to follow there as well. So thank you very much. And Shane O'Donnell is coming in on the screen there now. And Shane has been involved in many different aspects of men's health on the island as well. And he's going to talk with us in a few moments. But I suppose, Shane, your own expertise has been in the area of mental health and your own piece of research in relation to uh, middle-aged men in Ireland and in relation to suicide. Uh, you have a lot of experience as well. You're a young man with a lot, a lot of experience that have been out in the world. And I know at the moment you're also a health promotion officer with the HSE. But you're going to talk to us about Cardia because you've been involved with the construction uh, in relation to mental health and certainly looking forward to talking with you on the panel more about that. But we'll let you off with your slides at the moment and tell us a little bit more about your experience there. Thanks very much for that, Lorcan. i just share my screen now. Yeah, so this is the um, CORJA project. So CORJA stands for the Construction Industry Alliance to Reduce Suicide. And um, so I suppose what we are developing is a multi-level intervention to try and um, support people around their mental health and suicidal behavior in the construction industry. But why are we doing this, um, this study? So, well, yeah, why the, why the need for this study? So in, in other countries, we have research and data uh, around that men in the construction industry have higher suicide rates compared to the general male population. And we also know that the general male population in Ireland, the suicide rate is three and a half times higher than the female rate. But if we don't have that data in Ireland for, for kind of the levels of, of distress or anxiety or depression amongst people in the construction industry. So that's a major part of this project, as well as developing different training and resources that might be able to support people. So, you know, we talked about masculinity and, um, already and, and how that might be um, have an impact on mental health, so, you know, weakness to seek support, stuff like that. But I suppose it's perceived to be intensified in the construction industry. You know, a lot of people might say it's a kind of a macho culture. There's also other factors like social um, social and job specific factors. So people's background, ethnicity, education, but also long work hours, work schedule and time pressure, things like that. So what, what are we doing about it? So I suppose these are kind of the four 
parts of our project. So the, the first one there is to understand the problems. We've just finished a large scale survey, which uh, asked 1,645 men about their mental health. So you can see there the percentages of people who have experience of anxiety and depression in the past two weeks and who also have experience of suicidal thoughts, attempts or have been lost a loved one to uh, through suicide over the, over their lifetime so you know quite high numbers there and um, so now we have this kind of research or data to build uh, another part of that we're doing at the moment is talking to men as, as to why um, they might be feeling like this so the second one is understanding what works so there's been lots of programs and uh, interventions run in different countries so we want to use some of that knowledge and um, so we're looking at what the evidence is there of how to reduce stigma amongst men in relation to mental health, but also how do we improve general mental health outcomes in male dominated workplaces. So from this, then we're going to develop um, our program and what that's going to consist of is a general suicide awareness training that's specific to men in the construction industry. So uh, Ashley talked about safe talks will be something similar to that, but would have more kind of specific tips and tricks that, that are uh, related to, to the to the construction industry in Ireland. Also be developing a suicide intervention training. So um, how, if someone was suicidal on site, how would you intervene? How would you support that person to refer them on to um, professional support? Also linking in existing professional support in the industry. So EAP and um, counseling services and also 24 uh, seven support, telephone support line. Uh, awareness raising campaigns so things like world suicide prevention day mental health day um, also developing resources and toolkits that might be able to go on site uh, and finally capacity building so policies and procedures for for how to support workers on site around their mental health how wh what do you do if there's been an, a critical incident on site and things like that so you can really see it's kind of a suite of resources not just focusing uh, on one thing we're, we're trying to have it at, at multiple different levels so what does real change look like so I suppose we're only at the beginning of our program and so we can't report on the outcomes of the program to say what the change looks like I suppose what I see as a real change is the incredible buy-in and partnerships that we've built on this so early on so early on so I suppose from the national level the fact that the National Office of Suicide Prevention, the HSE, the Construction Industry Federation are providing funding and support to not only a gender sensitized program, but also one that's specific to the workplace that focuses on different kind of ages, that focuses on different occupation groups. So Noel was talking about intersectionality. So I suppose really getting the back into to conduct this research is huge change. Um, in terms of sectoral buy-in then from all the large construction industries that, that have really bought into this program and supported us in, in our research so far, um, down to the interpersonal individual level where we have just met people on the ground working in the construction industry that have just been helping us with this project and, and really welcome the idea of this project. I suppose where, where does this lead us or what do we hope that the, this real change will be? Um, I know Noel as well talked about this at the start, but we're hoping to change the culture in the industry that seeking help is not a sign of weakness and um, that it is a, a sign of a strength um, and really trying to change the idea that it's a, it's a macho culture um, th that people can kind of ask each other for help. Uh, and I just move through on the, on the last slide, but what do we hope this will, the outcome of this will be and that is to reduce the stigma around suicide and mental health in the industry, to improve suicide literacy. And I suppose what that means is knowledge, skills around suicide and to improve intention to seek help. Uh, and hopefully all of this will, will contribute to reducing suicide uh, in the construction industry. You can see Diana is joining us. Diana, sorry for leaving you so long, but it's good you're here with us now. Um, and uh, I think, Diana, you've been with us before, but a great expense we brought you back because what you really have to say, Noel has already mentioned on Farm Ground and we have Farm Connect as well, which is engaging with farmers. And uh, your own experience, of course, has been based around Farmers of Hearts and uh, a whole group uh, that's really interesting to find out more about. And I know your role has been in relation to research for that and all the way from the Netherlands, but you've been up there in Carla with the Men's Health Centre for a good while and your, B, your, your MA for, sorry, was the evaluation of the, the pilot programme for Farmers of Hearts, which is the Chagas Walsh Scholarship part of that. 
So I'm going to leave you over and then we'll bring you uh, onto the panel. You're not going to get much rest because we're getting close to the panel discussion. So thanks for joining us and uh, over to you, Diana. Uh, thank you, Lorcan. Um, yeah, so I am delighted to be here again and I'm talking a little bit more about the Farmers um, Have Hearts, um, which is, sorry, I have to, yeah, there we are. Um, the Farmers of Heart is a year-long um, health program targeted at farmers and we targeted uh, or we recruited farmers at smart settings and agri-branches and it consists out of a baseline health check after which the farmers uh, were offered a choice for a health behavior change support program and they could choose between a health coach um, by phone, uh, health promoting text messages, both um, interventions and those farmers not interested in um, taking part in an intervention were placed in the usual care group. At, all farmers were contacted at week uh, 26 by phone and then were all invited for week 20, uh, 52 for a an, um, health check. Um, at baseline, 868 farmers uh, participated and at week 52, 62% uh, um, came back. And this was an interagency uh, partnership between um, the partners you see under um, the screen. I'm talking today especially about the March settings. Um, so uh, first, um, a little insight in who our March farmer was. Um, farmers are considered a lower socioeconomic group in Ireland, and the March farmers compared to the agri-branch farmers in our study were more often um, having a lower educational attainments, so primary school only, um, more often single, um, involved in cattle farming, um, having smaller farm holding holders and part-time farmers. They were also significantly at higher risk for cardiovascular disease with having four or more risk factors for heart disease. Now, I have to be cautious because the agri-branch farmers were also at high risk, so we have to treat this cautiously. <clears throat> And we worked on the premise that March farmers would have a more traditional masculine view to health and a more functional view of health and prioritizing um, health over or farming over health. Um, the March is a setting of workplace for farmers, a place of business, but it is also very much a social hub. It has a strong social function with farmers coming for a meal to talk to other farmers doing some window shopping. And that's why the farm, the mart was a perfect setting to, to go out there and meet farmers in an, an, um, an, an trusted safe space for them and a convenient space where they had to be anyway and where they didn't have to change their clothes to take part in a health check. So underlying to work towards change among this group, we uh, deployed um, three um, pivotal um, and central placed um, uh, um, engagement strategies, which were gender specific, strength based and farmer centered. And this was to make the program much more agricultural competent uh, for farmers, so uh, designed to their specific needs. So we met farmers in a safe space. We um, worked around a clear um, health need. Um, we embraced the rural, uh, rural masculinities rather than working against them. We offered them choice. We had a non-judgmental approach and a personal approach, and we focused on achievable changes. So we looked at what was possible, and we very much embraced the farming culture as well and the farming occupational characteristics. So we met them on their turf. We were flexible. We were um, met the farmers locally. And we worked outside of office hours. And these um, program uh, strategies, they led to um, feelings of empowerment among the farmers and a higher um, level of self-efficacy and increased health awareness. And we had a high participant uh, satisfaction. And as a result, that was the aims of the programs as well. And as a result, we saw that farmers um, reported at week um, 52 that they um, in, embraced self-care and engaged in self-care and took uh, taking much more responsibility for their own health. And we also saw among this group that health was normalized. It was discussed um, and uh, much more attention for prevention of health. So if we're looking at steps for sustainable change, working with farmers, 
what worked in this program was the interagency approach, which meant that the farmers um, had, we had a maximize of reach to the farmers, but also the program was uh, much more um, acceptable for farmers and we had a high draw in. We worked evidence-based, setting space and had an outreach approach. We uh, deployed clear engagement strategies and had tailored support and follow-ups. And as a result, so these were gender specific strategies and as a result, we saw that health was much more normalized in this masculine um, environment, which is in much more towards gender transformative um, and taking control over their own health. Thank you. I'm just conscious, folks, when we go into the panel discussion and uh, Noel contextualized, you know, what real change would look like. And it's a really positive lens to put on the key learnings that we have in relation to engaging with men. Um, and I want to keep it on that if we can at all, but I, I suppose there is a million dollar question. I want to ask Noel this question at the very beginning. And it's, uh, and it's a simple question, Noel. And, uh, you know, are, are as men, are we, are we not interested in our health or are we doing it wrong forever? That we're not able to approach the great numbers of men in relation to caring more about our health? Because we've heard from the different demographics of men that there is a challenge out there in relation to men dealing with our health and masculinities. What's your understanding? Well, I think the answer is in Shane and Ashley and Diana's presentations. I mean, if, you, if, if anyone spoke to them before they started the programs they're leading out on, they would have said, you're mad to go into sheds, you're mad to go into farmers. I mean, the construction sector would never engage. So really, it's not about labeling men as being a problem or problematic or reluctant to engage. It's really about having the right strategy that sets out to engage men in a constructive, positive way that goes to out to communities and workplace settings where, where men are already at ease and comfortable with the world, asking men what they would like, respecting their inputs into program design, and seeing men as partners in the whole process. And down the side slide, there was very poignant when she talked about things like autonomy and self-efficacy improving and I think through the other presentations as well. So mm -hmm. I think that the danger is that we separate health into you know health services and we don't see it as being part of our lives and part of our and it's not taking ownership of it. Yeah which probably brings us to what Ashley was saying in relation to the sheds, actually, when you started to work, for example, in sheds for life and put the lens on and started to meet with the men and get to know the men. And you look at the powerful video we just watched that at so many levels talks about really transforming masculinities and men shift. You know, you might think that maybe men of a certain age, my age, even beyond, you know, that we're stuck in the way we might see things. That's not your experience, though, as Noel is saying, you, you know, the right environment, people will talk, men will talk. And I mean, it's, I, I guess the video did really kind of summarize that, but it, it's about giving people, it's a simple formula. I think for everyone, we're all human, you know, at the end of the day as well, leaving all the masculinities stuff to one side that it takes time to just build relationships with people. So building that rapport and, and working with men to ask them, well, what are your needs? You know, what can we do to respond to them? And, and also, as Noah said, bringing them in as partners in anything that we design or deliver, you know, they should have ownership. Um, and, you know, it was always discussed the sheds for life belonged to the men in the sheds. It wasn't something that was ever going to be pushed on them. So they had a shared sense of ownership about that. And, and that was empowering for, for men as well. You know, so that was really important. And that worked really well in terms of engagement um, because they felt like they were invested in, you know, um, and I think that was just it, it's, it can be can be messy work and, it, you know, it can seem a little bit complicated, but it actually is, you know, it's just about putting the energy in and building those relationships. Yeah, and valuing the men. I think that comes across very strongly in it, you know. And and Shane, if I can come to you for a moment, because, you know, for to go in and to be part of construction, as I say, not, it's not all men on construction are in construction now, but there's very, very large numbers of men that end up in construction. And you might be inclined, or some people might be inclined to think that is a very stereotypical maybe type of man that might be there in the context of uh, the way we might look at our health or engage with our health or stigma with me mental health. But you didn't find that, or did you? you? You found a kind of an openness and 
to be part of the, the, the research that you were doing? Yeah, to be honest, like, oh, I think I would have had my own <laughs> hesitation. Even though I work in men's health, I was kind of going in going, mm, I don't know how this is going to go. But we had a target of two to 300 people to fill out the survey, and we had to stop it at close to 1,700 because people just kept coming forward being like, can I be involved in this research? Companies and individual men. So I suppose it just goes to show about... Uh, well, kind of Ashley had said it and people like hard to reach so-called hard to reach groups or and I suppose it's just going in with the with the right mindset I think stigma of mental health just that you mentioned it can be funny I think we're, we've come a long way societally talking about the stigma of mental health and I think people were very willing to fill out the survey but when it comes down to kind of the individual talking about their own mental health I still think there is a little bit of stigma there so it's kind of okay f- to talk about mental health but I'm not going to be the one to put my hand up in the crowd so I think we still have a little bit more to come with that and I suppose how how do we overcome that is really just to in our individual reactions with each other interactions with each other normalizing those conversations there's sad things that happen in life there's angry things that happen in life and and their natural human responses and i think as men we try to hide all of those things uh, and i suppose it, it's just you know it's just normalizing those conversations and, and i suppose it, just that we're talking about it is just the importance of seeking help it's never too late to seek help it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of strength uh, and just the more the more we can have those conversations and actually initiate it i think that's how we start to overcome some of those issues yeah and uh, diana you hear the, the folks are saying here like you know the environment is really important the relational i think noel talked about the strengths-based approach uh, your experience as well with you know meeting the farmers you know, farmers have hearts at marts, you know, meeting them in the right environments. That's your experience as well, that that works well in relation to, yeah. Yeah, I think that was, you know, um, pivotal in this project to reach farmers. I think, you know, and that is from um, Australian research is that, you know, there's a bit of a mismatch maybe between, you know, farmers and traditional health services, as in, you know, they don't maybe naturally... Um, um answer to farmer specific needs um and this program was very much like you know the mart is a, is a crazy place it is loud it is busy there is lots going on and farmers feel like a fish in the water and there is this peer support dynamic um you know and and mart farmers didn't go to the mart in the morning to go to a health check so they they met us there and just talking about or you know meeting them in a cultural competent place where we talk their language and we were you know on their turf and we fa- had a hook to get them in um and we didn't talk a- about deficits as in okay x y and z is wrong so you have to do this and that and the other to change but we looked at where they were where their motivational stage was and that was tailored then with um appropriate behavior change techniques to their level so every farmer had their own level it wasn't an, an one fits all um place and that was very um important to connect with the farmers Um, And also to make them a partner in health, you know, they were um, learning to what health is, we had a personal approach, we explained, so they could make their own decisions about their health, it wasn't us telling them what to do, it was them understanding what they can do differently to make change, and we were there to support them, so we uh, facilitated them with the tools to actually make some changes in their life and how they could use their farm as a setting for health promotion. Um, so that was very important to connect with the farmers and to engage with them. Very good, very good. Um, Ashley, in the context of the sheds, just linked to what Diana is saying, maybe again, the environment, what stays with you, you know, just off the, your instinct, your intuition, outside of even the research or based on the research, but what was the, what was the thing that really, you know, was the, the you know, the, the conduit for change in relation to supporting men in sheds, that Sheds for Life was and has been such a really good program. That the ingredients are always there in the sheds themselves. And that like I when I had mentioned that they are so inherently health promoting because of the social support. So that men, you know, came together to support one another and but also having somebody to go in just to facilitate the conversation. So someone just to go in to start you know, to say it's okay that we talk about this 
health issue, whatever it might be, or maybe it's around mental health. And then, you know, there's that's kind of a catalyst then to start kind of almost a snowball effect. So if one man speaks up, then someone else will say, yeah, I actually have that experience as well. And it's, you know, around facilitating the trust there. And there will be kind of leaders and champions that come forward to help that, yeah. that maybe will pull men that are a little bit more, you know, nervous or hesitant about talking about these things along. So that's what works really well. But it's the social support and that informal delivery is really important. So, you know, it's it's a facilitated conversation rather than someone going in and delivering a lecture to men you know so and yeah. again tapping into the strengths the men them have that they have so much experience to share themselves you know yeah. so uh giving them the space for that yeah yeah and Noel kind of said the same Noel you you I loved your slide around the Larkin Centre I've seen that slide somewhere before but it's a really lovely slide that was one of your first engagements with such a program just uh, can you say a little bit more about that because it seemed to really catch you in a way, even yeah. as a researcher, there was something different about that experience. I think Ashling and Dan has changed the dresses already, but I think breaking the ice and things is really important and uh, giving permission for men to talk and open up. And once that happens, like men will sort it out for themselves after that. And I saw some really lovely examples of peer support in the Larkin Centre and fun as well. Yeah. Should I start with the fun? I mean, Anytime I visited the Larkin Centre, it was just hilarious. You know, the, the men were so witty and so sharp. And the fun they had in taking part, whether especially in the cookery classes. I mean, it was just such entertainment. You know, they were having such fun. So there's a lot in that. But also then the, their, their willingness to support one another. I was in a workshop one day and, and one man who was on methadone treatment and um, kind of fell asleep in, in his chair and was kind of slipping off the chair. And another man just got up and walked behind him and gave him support and popped him up. And he didn't say anything. The workshop just continued on. But it was a lovely example of instinctive, you know, b- behavior to support someone who, was, who needed support. Yeah. And maybe, maybe that was always going to happen, but the Larkin Centre just created that environment that allowed men to talk and to support one another yeah and once that once the ice is broken i think everything else followed very good very good and tell me this Noel, when i stay with you for a moment because i'm thinking you said also that you know we're talking about men and change and what real change looks like in relation to health or masculinities um we, we said it was beyond behaviors right it's beyond behavior so it has to be bigger than that and in the context of anybody can come in on this for me you know what does real change look like then? Uh, you know, what's missing at the moment, for example, maybe in relation to policy or research, as well as just for the men themselves? What do you think is missing if there is something missing that could add to supporting that real change? Do you want to say something on that, Noel? That I might begin. I think it's a really yeah. good question, Larkin. Um, and I think one of the you know, real challenge with kind of gender mainstreaming documents and frameworks that have been developed here and elsewhere in that they, you know, health service or health service providers don't really understand them or get them. So I think we need some very simple toolkits that would support service providers to apply a gender lens to health service development and delivery. And that, that, that would do so in a very straightforward and accessible way. And actually, I was kind of slagging off the, my colleagues who were asking such basic questions 20 years ago. But um, in a sense, they were really important questions. So if you start by asking where are the men, that, yeah. that, that, that you're already well on the way to figuring out, well, you know, if I'm offering a service and men aren't turning up, as Colin Fowler might say, you know, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're running a shop and no customers are coming in, you wouldn't say, what's wrong with the customers? <laughs> You'd probably reflect on the shop and say, what, what, what are you selling or when are you selling it? So by asking where are the men, that, 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 that's, you're on the first rung of the ladder at least, yeah. looking at what, what a gendered approach might look like. And over time then, I think we have a really rich resource to draw upon in the programs that have been described today and, and others. Yeah. And applying those principles and practices really would keep us in good stead. Uh, the others might like to add. 
Yeah, anybody else like to come in on that? It's a, from a research point of view. I have a few thoughts. I suppose, strictly speaking, research. I think we need, we've done a lot of great work on identifying the best practices of engaging men, but I think we need to start linking those to health behavior change techniques and really identifying within programs what exactly is working and what's not working and linking them to existing theories of health behavior change so we can develop stronger programs. If we develop stronger programs, then we can start running randomized control trials, maybe on some programs that will give us a stronger evidence base, give us more credibility, allow us to get bigger pots of fun and to deliver more programs. I think that's something that we, we need to work towards. I think the talk, when we talk about intersectionality, um, we need to, I suppose, really do deeper dives into intersectionality and look at how masculinity intersects with different aspects of identity, age, sexuality, occupations, all of those things to really have a targeted approach of who needs what, when and where. Uh, and I suppose finally, the thing I think is is maybe missing is those sort of sometimes social programs for men between the ages of 30 and 45 or 50 like so you know a lot of sheds are brilliant i love sheds i've been in loads of sheds but sometimes younger men go i'm not going to go to a shed i've plenty more living to do or i'm not retired yet or that or that kind of thing so i think sometimes that kind of age group maybe we're missing some sort of social programs for for that age group okay I, I um, have something as well. I would really like to see, you know, where the implementation of bro programs go and then the translation from the implementation into policy um, and as well, uh, maybe longer follow up. So we have these programs now, you know, my program was a year, uh, 10 weeks, but how does that translate in two years or three years? Um, so I, I would like to see um, that as well. Very good, very good. As an add-on. Wow. Follow up on that point as well, Diane. I think it's a really, really important point. And I, I think it's important that we, we take a step back as well. So Noel spoke about, well, if the shop isn't working, you don't blame the customers. So having that kind of ecological view, you know, that broader view of what is happening in the environment, you know, what's happening at the systems level in terms of what policies we have. So we're really lucky in Ireland that we have a men's health policy. Lots of countries don't have that from, you know, so from the, the top down to the bottom up, well, what's, what's happening, you know, capture all those facilitators and barriers how do we address those really important structural barriers that stop men from actually engaging with health or when they go to seek help is the support there so Shane made that important point that you know it is becoming more normalized to talk about it but is the support there when they do or when they reach out you know um that's really really important and I see there's a, a question there in the Q&A and &A, I think it kind of runs nicely along, along this around, you know, the language that we use. So, um, you know, blaming masculinity as being the cause for men's poor health as well, you know, and that there is really positive elements of masculinity that can be health enhancing. So, you know, resilience and, and all of those things are really important. So we need to be able to challenge our views as practitioners and, and deliverers as well, you know, in terms of, um, again, just coming back to that question, do we know how to talk about masculinities properly? Are we confident yeah. with that? So maybe it's around building capacity there as well. Yeah. Noel, do you want to add to that about talking about masculinities? You know, the, it can be the complexity of it. You know, it's not the normal conversation that you'll bring to a football match or to a, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was looking at the questions in the chat, as Ashley mentioned, the, and one of the participants makes a really good point about you know, it's so easy to, to to gravitate towards this kind of stereotypical view of masculinity. And one of the one of the objectives of Engage is to actually get participants to reflect on that, um, and to reflect on their experience of engagement in the past and how that might shape future engagements. Yeah. So I do think we need to we need to be much more, I suppose generous in our approach to men and not to assume that all men fall within the narrow confines of the alpha male, you know. Yeah. And and even for those that might do that, rather than to blame them for, for those behaviors or attributes, to ask the question, well, what's what's driving that behavior? What is it about the cultural environment in which they live that that prompts of or, or encourages that kind of behavior. Yeah. That makes sense. 
tell me this, uh, and anybody can come in on this. I'm looking at all of you on the screen, and all of you come from an evidence. You underpin the work with evidence, which is really, really important. And I think that's what real change looks like as well, where you have strong evidence. But all of you as well, the evidence you collect, it comes through, um, what would you say, a lens that's very relational and engaging. So it's not three steps away from the process. As I say, Ashling or Diana or Shane, you're very hands-on in meeting with the core and the, the groups of people that you work with. So you have a really good instinct and experience of what's going on. Would link to that, that, in, that can inform what Noel has just said. Maybe he mentioned it already and he had it in one of his slides. The importance of, of capacity building then. What does real change look like you know, in, in capacity building? Where, where do we need to be going? Or what have we achieved in relation to building capacity of frontline service providers in relation to engaging with men and teasing out what we mean by exploring masculinities? Anybody like to come in on that? I come in, Lorcan, just to begin with. I think the, the Engage programme has been really important, as I mentioned earlier, both in terms of giving participants the skills and knowledge to engage men more effectively, but also encouraging them to reflect on their practice and the culture in, within the organisations and how open to engaging men they might be. So I think that, that's, that's been a really positive development. And more recently, as I said, it's it's branched out into, you know, extending beyond more than, more traditional service providers to engage the agricultural advisors with farmers and on mental health especially. So that's been a really positive development. Great. I do think there's there's a lot more we can do in, if we're trying to mainstream health across the HST by getting it into CHO areas and trying to get, we're, we're looking at this, say, with the New iteration of healthy Ireland men. How can we, you know, what, what what tasks do we need to take on to mainstream men's health across CHO areas and to incorporate men's health into existing programs along the lines Shane was mentioning there? Yeah. Anybody else, folks? Is there possibilities? I don't want to ask about gaps, but what are the possibilities then, do you think, based on your own evidence and research around, you know, literally working towards real change and sustaining that? Are there other things we need to be doing? Ashling, have you any ideas? Um, I think it just, again, it's kind of having that multi-layered view of things. So, like, you know, which we look at, you know, working with men themselves in terms of their uh, getting men to engage around normalizing meaningful conversations. So very much that transformative approach. But again, it also comes down to normalizing these conversations for the people who are delivering these programs or who have an interest in, and challenging the view or maybe the stereotypes that they believe that, you know, it's just a natural thing that men just don't have, um, you know, as, as good health as women for all of the complex reasons and that there's not a whole lot that we can do about it because um, there's so much out there now to contradict that, to say that actually it's just the approach that we're not, we're not um, you know, we need to adapt. We need to be able to change our approach so we can't really keep saying that men are just hard to reach. Again, it's more that, uh, you know, we need to uh, adjust how we try to reach them. And all of these programs are demonstrating that actually we can do that. So it's just about, you know, having the energy for that and putting in that effort yeah. and uh, following the evidence. Very good. Very good. Folks, I'm conscious of time because I want to bring Fergal on in a few moments as well. But if I was just to go around and ask each of you, in the context then of real change and what does real change look like, is there anything that really stands out for you? You know, you're a fair while in the field, all of you, in relation to the work that you've been doing. And even though you have specific pieces of research you've been involved in, you've certainly been across other areas of work. Uh, and is there something that really stands out for you? in relation to what you think is a real change over the last maybe even 10 years uh, in relation to masculinities and health and well-being? What would, the, what would be the thing that would stand out for you? And it comes to mind, though, for yourself. that You've probably mentioned a few of them already, I think. I'd, I would say, that one, if I was to name one thing, I would say having an open mind in how you approach a particular cohort of men not assuming they're going to be hard to reach or difficult to engage, but going in in a respectful way with an open mind um, and trying to bring about incremental change whilst engaging men as partners in the, in the process. 
Very good. Thank you very much. Hey, Anna, anything that stays with you? Yeah, well, I am lucky enough that I am, you know, involved with the farmers since 2013 when I started my master's. And this is actually a unique position because often, you know, people come and go on these projects. So I have seen where in 2013, where this was completely new at the march and farmers didn't know what to do with this army of nurses and people coming in to now where they are oh there you are again and you know a much more open mind so i have seen that this consistent um attendance and the the implementation of the program uh, you know what was then a single uh, health check program um start normalizing um, yeah. health so it is also the 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 persistence and the the growing and the the you know the of, of knowledge uh, rather than going in and out it's not about an injection it's about you know the bandage which it goes there and, and stays there to keep it together and that um, slowly um, changes an outlook on health and normalizes health as well very um, good. yeah very good point yeah really good point you know so that's a, I didn't know you were there that long and that's great it's really good to have that consistency there in that piece of work as well um, Shane anything stays with you you you've been up the middle of the field for the last number of years, keeping an eye on all aspects of men's health, really, you know, just uh, what stays with you, do you think? I think, Lorca, it sounds so simplistic, but and it kind of touches what Noel said, but just going in, listening, just listen to what people have to say. You know, as a researcher, you go in with, you always go in with some idea of what the problem is or how to fix it. And you're almost waiting for them to tell you the part that you think you already think is is the problem and i suppose yeah. the idea of just going in and listening to people just sit down you're not the expert here they're experts people are experts in their own lives so just go in listen take on board what people have to say come up with some ideas and go back and ask those people is that what you meant and i think if we all just do that and listen to people we'll go a long way in, in trying to help people rather than thinking we know what's best yeah well said Ashling, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I definitely can echo what Shane is saying in terms of, you know, bringing in the expertise in the room. Like, it, it's just so important. The men know themselves better than you could ever possibly know them. They have the tools that they need to change. And it's just about facilitating that. And, and one thing that I learned from Sheds for Life is that, you know, their own perceptions of what it means to be masculine evolves then, you know, when they have that space to even think about that. And just to, I suppose, remember that men aren't victims of their masculinity, as in they're not powerless against it. It's not just this thing that controls them, you know, that they have a level of agency and they can be reflexive about it and uh, they can use uh, you know masculinity in a positive way as well so it's really important for them to know that and i think that that those perceptions are changing so 